I'm Stephen Burt and I'm going to start with a few more thank yous because we could not have done this on our own and uh, I'm pleased to say that many of the names on here uh, are in this room so a personal thank you for all the work that, uh, that you've done to help us do this. Um, Tim would also like to thank Keeble College for his, uh, his appointment which uh, has helped with the, the work and of course we do have to thank the two Mrs Burt's to Mrs. Burt's were hands up, Helen's at the back, Elizabeth's there. So thank you for that. Um, so what we'll cover is we'll cover a little of the, uh, the history of the observatory, a little bit about climate change, what the records can, can tell us, um, and then we'll uh, finish off with some photographs, some noteworthy weather. Uh, we're happy to take any questions <coughs> after that as well. Uh, Amy knows all the answers as well, so... Uh, We'll, uh, we might defer to you. So, the Radcliffe Observatory, um, those of you who accompanied us on the tour uh, will have, have seen the, the building itself. Um, it's not the oldest or not the longest weather record in Europe, it is the longest weather record in the British Isles. Uh, Paris had an observatory uh, measuring the weather back to about 1688. Um, there's a bit of a gap in the records, there's another gap around 1789 for reasons that are probably obvious. Um, the records, the longest weather record in Europe is from Uppsala in Sweden. Um, Helen and I were lucky enough to visit that uh, last month. And um, unfortunately the site has moved a couple of times. Uh, the same with Padua, which has moved in the 1980s. Um, the record at Stockholm Observatory has been uh, in the same place in 1756. Um, but Oxford is up there with the rest of them. At the beginning of this uh, renaissance in, uh, in observation that took place in the middle of the uh, 18th century. Now all of these sites, bar the very last one, started off as astronomical observatories. And the reason for that was that they needed the temperature and the pressure records to correct the star positions for refraction. So this gave an institutional longevity to the record that will couldn't be maintained with just one person or one family doing the, the records. The very last one on the list, Valencia in southwest Ireland, was where the first cable, the telegraph cable, came in from the US, right to the west of Ireland, so it was an excellent place to start doing weather observations as most of the weather comes from the west. Um, so that started off as a British observatory. Um, and then, of course, the Republic of Ireland uh, took it over in 1921. There are still bullet holes in the walls of uh, Valencia Observatory from a minor disturbance um, in 1921. So I think on this point, um, I'd like to hand over to Tim, um, who will tell us a little bit about the history of the observatory and uh, some of the characters involved. Thanks. Well, here's um, the important man, really, uh, Thomas Hornsby, who was civilian... Uh, professor of astronomy from 1763 uh, uh, 1763 or 73 63 and um, he was clearly interested in the weather he wasn't just taking temperature and pressure readings because he wanted to correct his thermometers as early as um, 1758 he was in correspondence to uh, decide on the best design of a, of, of a ring gauge and he made measurements we think in Corpus Christi College he was certainly making measurements in uh, New College Lane after he became professor and he seemed uh, after one or two false starts um, to get really enthusiastic in 1767 and I'd like to think that's because he was getting ready to go to the Radcliffe Trust and say you know build me an observatory and um, but we've got results from um, 1760, as you can see here, um, and these, this is the earliest page that we have of them. I suspect there may have been earlier ones, but that we just don't have the pages. And um, he was responsible for getting the observatory built, moving into the observer's house in about 1772, by which time the measurements were being made there. And as those of us who were at the, the, the tour of the college know, um, to start with, most of the measurements were made on the roof or on the back wall, the north wall of the uh, observatory. And gradually over the years, as I'll show in a moment, uh, things have moved down onto the lawns. But there are um, Hornsby's um, three readings a day. But as Stephen said earlier, 
he sometimes got excited and you might find five or eight or ten um, if something really good was, was going on. Um, so there's the view as we saw it, some of us this afternoon, um, from the sort of southeast. And um, this is uh, uh, an engraving that comes from Green Templeton College. And, um, you know, there's the building in all its glory as we, as we see it today. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the Radcliffe Trust spent 32,000 on, uh, on the observatory, which would be about three or four million in today's money, and um, 4,000 on instruments, um, which seems not a lot. But Hornsby earned £150 a year uh, for being the, the uh, civilian professor and the director of the observatory. So um, times were a bit different there. But of course, the generosity of the Radcliffe Trust is what very much started things off. Um, there's the view as we didn't quite see it today because we were sort of over a bit closer to the building. Um, I don't suppose that's a view that we should see for very long if a new building's to be built there, but it does show how wonderful the, um, the observatory looks uh, from whichever vantage point you can see it. Um, now you'd expect geographers to think about the site and situation of the observatory. Um, the situation is that, of course, the observatory is on the Summertown Radley Terrace, so slightly up above the floodplain, but very much in the Thames Charwell Valley, and so the instance of fog and frost uh, down in the valley is, um, is very clear in the records, um, and we'll say a bit more about that later on. In terms of the actual site, well, this is an 1887 OS map, and here's the original uh, sort of curtilage of the, of the observatory. And this wall was the edge of the city in 1772. Observatory Street didn't come along until 1834. And then, quite quickly, the building extended up Woodstock Road and Banbury Road uh, towards Summertown and, and North Oxford. So there's been incursion uh, to the north, um, within a few decades, of course building over uh, towards the canal and building over towards um, more sort of where the engineering department and uh, Norm Gardens and so on uh, are to be found today. Um, and if we look at a, 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 an air photo of the same site you can see much the same sort of area that's just drawn in here and it gives you an idea of the uh, of the site and the way in which gradually there's been an incursion around it. We think there is a small um, urban heat island effect in the data. Uh, Gordon Smith and Gordon Manley argued about this um, in the 50s and 60s and had quite a spat. Um, Manley thought that there was a, a, an urban heat island effect. Gordon Smith was adamant that there wasn't. Um, but Manley thought it was about 0.1 of a degree C, and we think now it might be something more like 0.2. But I was talking to um, Mark, I think it was earlier, and we were talking about um, that, in fact, perhaps there's some celebration of having an urban station that's very long, because too many of our urban stations have, have closed. And so if we want to know, we need something like the Radcliffe just to show us what's going on in a in a, a city that's steadily built up in terms of area and traffic and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there we are. Um, that's the, um, the, the site and situation of the, of the observatory. Um, as we said on the tour, um, the instrumentation has moved around. Um, this is the, oh sorry, um, this is the country life photograph that we managed to acquire um, from 1930 and it's significant because it shows the two Stevenson screens standing out on the front lawn and um, that's where they stayed until 1939. Originally instrumentation as I said was either up on the west or the east parapet or on the north wall. Um, the rain gauges quite quickly uh, moved to the, um, the north lawn where they've been ever since. The temperature records were really on the South Lawn until the Second World War, but even then the North Lawn had gauges in the 1920s and that provided some comparison when the gauges were moved 
1939, mainly because it was anticipated that the infirmary would expand and that would encroach onto the uh, to the Met Pen uh, where where we see it today. So this is a this is a, a significant photo. It also shows the paraphernalia which held the anemometer, and you can't. Oh, the, and the Campbell Stokes recorder is actually there. You can see as a black dot. Must have been taken on a slow shutter speed because you can, you know, the cups have merged into a circle. Um, but that's the uh, that's the anemometer spinning round. And uh, Gordon Smith always said his greatest achievement was not keeping the, the, the records going, but getting rid of this clutter from the roof and moving it to the engineering tower in, in 1976. So, so good on, on Gordon for that. Stephen was saying earlier that probably country life today would Photoshop out the Stevenson screens because yes. they would be clutter in an otherwise nice piece of architecture. Um, but anyway, we've got the original. And as I said uh, earlier on, we had Hornsby's um, original observations. Here's his observations from 1776, by which time he was firmly uh, ensconced in the observer's house. This is perhaps the most um, sad entry in the whole of the records. Um, it says here, wine beg began to freeze in my study. You can see the word snow here. And in fact, at this stage, it had got down to 16 Fahrenheit. A bit further down here, um, a couple of days later, it got down to 6 Fahrenheit. There was no mention of wine freezing uh, further down. He'd clearly taken his decanter somewhere else and uh, <laughs> put, it, put it somewhere a bit warmer. But, you know, there can't be any worse fate for an Oxford professor than to have their wine freeze in their, in their study. And um, the unbroken record goes from um, November 1813. There was the start of the daily record in 1811, Hornsby having died, I think, in 1805, and by then his records were a bit random and, and haphazard. Whether, um, and, and we, the May, by May 1811, the records had, had, st had stopped. But whether they started a bit earlier than November 1813, we're not sure. But this is the earliest record we have, and that's upstairs in Richard Washington's office. And from then on, we have an unbroken record. To start with, the temperatures were um, three times a day minimum. But we did discover, as a result of, of the archival work that we've done getting ready for the book, that maximum minimum thermometers data are from April 1815. Um, so we have, um, we have standard max and min data, which is what everybody else uses pr uh, pretty well. Um, and so although the Oxford record is very carefully corrected by um, the observers when they write their reports, because there was a correction factor worked out to go from these records and, and indeed from max and min to what was considered the average temperature taking the whole diurnal cycle into account. We've been able to produce also a, um, a, a record based on maximum and minimum, which means we've got a straight comparison with pretty well every other record station. So you can take what you like, really. You can either take the corrected record, uh, which is what continues to be published, or you can take the half max and min record, and we'll have both up on the website, because that way people know that there is a slight difference between between the two. I'm just going to pop back to this because look at the number of observations that Hornsby was taking on these days because it was clearly very cold and he was clearly very excited by <laughs> the cold weather. So back to Stephen. Thanks Tim. So we have all these records, all this data, so what can the records tell us? So. I'll go through, first of all, the temperature record. So what we have here are the annual mean temperature. So this is the mean minimum temperature, the mean maximum temperature, and the mean temperature, which is the average of, of these two. So this is for every year from 1814 up to 2018. And you can see there's obviously a lot of year-to-year -year variation. Um, here's 1879, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, here's last year, which is one of the warmest on record. Uh, 2014, I think, was the, the warmest year on record. But the trend is upwards. There's no question 
of that. Um, the climate in Oxford is getting warmer. So the coldest year was uh, 1879, mean of 7.7. .7. That would be a pretty cold year if we had it this time. Um, 2014 we had a uh, mean of 11.8. Um, also on here is uh, what's known as Oxford's climate stripe. This is from one of my colleagues at uh, Reading, Ed Hawkins. And this shows the mean temperature of every year with a vertical bar coloured dark blue for the coldest and dark red for the warmest. And it portrays very quickly and easily. You can see how much the, uh, the years have warmed recently. Um, when we had the book published, uh, when we were talking about doing the, um, the, back, the, the, the dust cover, um, we said to OUP that uh, actually we quite like this on the back cover. And OUP said no, we can't have it on the back cover because the booksellers will think it's a barcode. <laughs> and it won't work. So it's on the inside front cover instead. Uh, but I think it's a marvellous way of, uh, of showing the, the, the variation, how recent, how warm the years have uh, been recently. So to put it into numbers, uh, if we take the first 30 years of the record, uh, the mean temperature was 9.3, and the last 30 years, up to 2018, the mean is just over 11. 9.3 is the current mean temperature of somewhere like Durham or Edinburgh. So Oxford, 200 years ago, would be more like the climate of Edinburgh today. And I think you would notice the difference between Edinburgh and Oxford. And in 200 years' time, who knows? Oxford might be warmer than Rome. So we'll have to come back in 200 years' time and, uh, and see. But just subtracting one from the other, the difference is around 1.7 degrees C. So Oxford's warmed about 1.7 degrees C in 200 years. Um, and as Tim mentioned earlier, the urban component of that uh, is around 0.2 degrees C. There is some urban warming, but it's not all entirely due to the, due to the buildings and so on. Um, so that's what we see from, from here. So there is a clear temperature trend. And that's reflected in the growing season. If we plot on here the beginning and the end of the growing season every year, this is March, April, May, September, October, November, uh, again from 1814 up to 2018, there's a clear expansion of the growing season. And you can see it's got longer over the years. Again, some variation from year to year. But the growing season in Oxford now is about 30 days longer than it would have been at the beginning of the, uh, of the record. Um, and certainly in Thomas Hornsby's day, there would have been no question of growing vines in the Thames Valley. Um, and there are now quite a few successful commercial vineyards in the Thames Valley. So let's have a look at the rainfall record. So again, what we have here is the uh, annual totals, this time from 1767, the beginning of the rainfall record. Um, and we're showing here the, the variation from year to year, the, the grey lines, and the red line is a 10-year running mean ending at the period. And so you can see that some of the early years were extremely wet, extremely wet. And then there was a long dry period in the 1780s to the beginning of the, uh, the 19th century. But since then, there's very little trend in the rainfall. And we would kind of expect the rainfall to increase with a warming climate, just simply because warm air can hold more moisture. Um, but in fact, there's no significant trend in rainfall. Since 1862, that's the beginning of the current uh, standard of, of measurements. Um, but certainly the winters are becoming wetter than the summers. We can see that very dramatically here. Again, going back to the, uh, the 1770s, at that time of year, certainly through most of the 19th century, the summers were much wetter than the winters. And in recent years, you can see the, wetters, uh, the winters are now much wetter than the summer. So this is a very clear, distinct trend. Now, how much of this is due to the fact that perhaps in the early years of the record, perhaps they didn't measure the snowfall quite as well as we would do it these days? Perhaps there was more snow? Uh, perhaps... I don't know, a lot of the snow was lost from the gauge or, or, or something. We'll never know. Without a time machine, we'll never know that. Um, but it certainly looks as if there is a uh, pretty continuous trend in, uh, in winter rainfall, which is, of course, what the climate models tell us is likely to happen. The winters are likely to get wetter. So one other major part of the record is the sunshine record. The records at the Radcliffe began in February 1880, one of the first sites to be issued uh, with the Sunshine Recorder, then very, very new, 
piece of technology um, by the Met Office in February 1880. So we have complete annual records from 1881, um, and again we have the uh, annual totals and the 10-year uh, the 10-year running mean. And um, Oxford, as well as getting slightly warmer, is getting sunnier. You can see there's a distinct pickup in sunshine in the last two or three decades. And this is mainly, we think, because the winters are getting sunnier, because there's less pollution, there's less fog, there's less um, aerosols in the air to actually damp the, uh, the sunshine. So the sunniest year uh, on Oxford Records was uh, back in 1995. Uh, last year was not far off, still one of the sunniest years on record. Um, 1888 wasn't a good year. Anybody here remember 1888? <laughs> Probably not. Um, 1888 right down at the bottom of the list. And we'll come back to 1888 a couple of times uh, later on. And again, if we look at 30-year averages for the first 30 years of the record and compare with the most recent 30 years, the sunshine's gone up by 11%. So for Oxford residents, that's good news. Warmer and sunnier. And no increase in rainfall except perhaps in the winter. Now one of the things that Tim and I wanted to do was to publish the entire data set. Uh, and we've published this in tables in the book in hard copy form but we've also made it or we are making it available on the university website as well so all the original data the daily data back to 1813 the monthly data for rainfall back to 1767 are all available on the website and will be very very shortly i know that's being worked on uh, at the moment but there are tables in the book of the by month and year there's the mean maximum mean minimum total rainfall highest and lowest temperature sunshine where we have the data um, so there's a full set of reference uh, in there as well. And one of the appendix consists of all the details of the instruments as well, which, most of which hasn't been published before. So at this point I'm going to hand back to Tim, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about some notable weather. Good, thank you. Well, we, um, I think one of the, the things we're pleased with in the book is just... Uh, the number of photos. It might have been good to have even more, but um, photos are a great way of providing a bit of sort of human story to what might be otherwise sort of dry numerical data. And um, snow and flood and drought and warm summers uh, uh, tend to uh, attract a lot of um, photographs. So here's the snowiest um, or the greatest snowfall in Oxford's history. Um, February 1888, 61 centimetres of snow. Here's a, a contemporary photograph. This is uh, the Torpids races, and um, it doesn't look a great day to be out on the river, but anyway, um, there they were. The greatest snowfall of the 20th century was April 1908, so one of those very late uh, snow dumps of snow, which we get from, from time to time, and um, this was 43 centimetres in just 15 hours. I think the equivalent 43 centimetres, that would have given you a depth of about 47 millimetres of, if had it been uh, rainfall. And there you can see a picture of, of the high um, on, on the next day and, um, and the bottom end of St Giles at, at the same time. And the Oxford uh, County History photo collection was a, was a rich source for uh, some of these photographs. Uh, more recently, big snowfall at the beginning of March 1947. Uh, it was a cold winter. Most of the snow came late on in the winter. Here's Beechcroft Road, where John and Brenda live, um, just a bit further along there. We shall be staying uh, along there tonight, happily. And um, yeah, this is, and we should come back to 1947 um, a, a little bit later in the, in the month, as it were. Uh, here's a more recent view from 1982, Hillview Road and um, again the disruption of snowy winters but these have got rarer and rarer and um, uh, and and so these photos are perhaps becoming uh, less less common than, than, than they used to be um, february 1895 or the winter of 1895 was one of the big cold winters wherever you are uh, i think windermere froze um, there are some lovely photos from durham of people skating on the river weir and here are people curling on Christchurch Meadows. Um, so they obviously had their, their curling stones to the, to the ready and off they went. And I think that's a wonderful photograph. Here's uh, sort of horse and carriages out on the river just to the, uh, the west of, of Christchurch Meadows. And um, 
we think what was happening here is that these people were queuing up to sort of pay threepence or sixpence and go for a ride in a you know in a carriage on on the river um, but it looks as if it was quite um, an exciting occasion anyway but uh, but it was a very cold winter and um, but it's good to have these have these photos and and this is an interesting photo which is in the um, in the School of Geography's collection because it actually shows 1963 which of course was a very cold winter um, almost off the scale by current standards um, but what's interesting about this is that Donington Bridge was only opened in October 1962 by Harold Macmillan who would then have been Prime Minister but was also of course Chancellor of the University and um, who could have thought that just a couple of months after he'd opened the new bridge here would be people skating and sliding out on on the river and uh, I think that's a, a, a happy photograph as, as, as well in terms of the, the sort of archive. Um, let's think a little bit about floods, you might expect me to be excited about floods. Um, only November 1770 has been wetter than November 1852 but that was one of the very big uh, floods. This is a, uh, the inundation of Christchurch Meadow, uh, an engraving um, no gauging of the river at that stage so we have to wait a bit later on. Um, floods and the railway south of Oxford seem to have been a continuing story in the latter part of the 19th century. Um, the floods of 1852 caused them to raise the railway line by about a foot. The floods of October 1875 caused them to raise the railway line by another foot or so and then the floods of November 1894 and they had to do it all over again and, and push them up. So flooding and the railway has been a bit of an issue. Um, this is after the start of the gauging of the Thames uh, at Kingston, and um, and so we can go to um, we can go to, to records and know that this is the biggest flood recorded uh, in London. We have to wait until 1938 to get more recent gauging uh, at Abingdon at Days Weir, um, but you know these are some of the biggest events that, that have been recorded and I love these pictures of people out you know working their way along the railway line just to see what the damage was often the floods as you can see here washed away the ballast and so everything had to be had to be repaired um, we've already seen snow in March 1947 here's some flooding from the end of the month um, and it was the wettest ever March, the biggest precipitation total. This is down on the um, on the Abingdon Road, and, and so is this, I think, showing sort of people getting by in one way or another. Now, um, July 2007, um, 59 millimetres fell in the day at the at the observatory. 70 millimetres fell at White and Wood. If you've been over at Pershaw, 157 millimetres and uh, these were the occasions when there were really big floods on the Severn. Tewkesbury was pretty well surrounded, Gloucester was badly flooded and, um, and in a way Oxford's just on the, uh, on, on the sort of eastern flank of that heaviest rainfall but nevertheless um, flooding at the Osney Arms and, um, but still not stopping people having a, having a pint and enjoying the, enjoying the scene. Um, more recently, um, Jane, or ever know oh, Jane's at the back there, who's been um, very kind uh, with her photography of floods um, in her sort of neck of West Oxford, probably too uncomfortably close to the house at times. But uh, um, we we've, we've got Jane's photos, which we first used, I think, in geography review, and then um, we've used in the book. This is December 2012. These cancellations are flooding in. 2014 and here's one of Jane's pictures and one of Stephen's um, of, of bad flooding pretty well within a, within a year of, of, of one another these, these episodes and um, that takes us back to Stephen So since it's summer um, at the moment or at least allegedly it's summer or it is quite warm today um, we thought we'd have a look at um, the best and worst summers so what we've uh, shown here and in the book is an index of the summer which combines temperature, rainfall and sunshine 
to give a measure overall of the uh, of the summer. So the the dark green lines uh, show the figures for each individual summer, and again the red line is the ten year running mean. This is the really mean for the last thirty years or so. Um, and this goes back to the first year of Sunshine Records, which obviously is 1880. Um, but with a little bit of um, statistical hokery-pokery, we can come up with Sunshine figures for the 1870s, which were an interesting decade. Um, Sunshine Records were made at a couple of places in 1879, which is just as well, uh, because it was by far the worst summer on record. And with an estimate of Sunshine, we can come up with a, uh, an index of around 320, which makes it the worst summer, um, certainly in the last 150 years or so. Uh, 1888 was pretty bad. Uh, 1912 was pretty bad. Where's 1912? Uh, the year before was an absolutely scorching summer. So the contrast from 1911 to 1912 must have been pretty uncomfortable, really. Um, and that's happened a couple of times. But I, I see, Stephen, there's Felix's 1927 so amongst yeah. the worst yeah, yeah. summers. So. Yeah, yeah, not very, not very great summers. Um, one thing perhaps to, to, to pick out is that if you look at some of the summers in recent years, which people have thought have been not great, take it back not too many years, it would have been a once in ten year good summer. So the summers are definitely, uh, are definitely improving. Um, on this basis of the index, 1976 still tops the list, but last summer was just behind, just a little bit behind. Um, 1995, 1911, 1899, 1975 uh, all appear in, uh, in, in that list as well. Uh, but we're going to come back to 1888 uh, a little bit later on. Um, now another summer that was, it was probably worse than 1879, was the summer of 1816. Uh, the year before, in the uh, East Indies, a, a volcano called Tambora blew up. Massive uh, volcanic eruption, cast a volcanic veil around the world, and dropped the temperatures globally uh, for two or three years afterwards. Now this plot, let me explain uh, what this plot shows. It shows for each month of the year, from 1814 up to uh, the beginning of 1818, the rank in terms of mean temperature of that month. So if it was the coldest on the record, it's up at the top, and if it was amongst the warmest in the record after 200 years, it's towards the bottom. And you don't need to be a statistician to see the concentration of really cold months in 1815, 1816, 1817. So 1816 was certainly a dreadful year. And we can look at the actual day-to-day -day records of the observatory in July 1816, um, and this was about the time when um, Frankenstein was written, the novel was written in Geneva during a particularly cold and wet, uh, cold and wet spell. And in fact, if we look at the actual observations, you can see the observers were starting to run out of adjectives here. <laughs> cloudy, 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 windy, cloudy and windy, stormy and windy, cloudy, stormy and windy, cloudy, 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 stormy. Stormy and windy. So there's not a lot of warm sunny days listed in here. The temperatures are pretty dire as well. Day maxima, sort of low 60s, below 20 degrees C. This is the warmest, around 21 degrees C. Uh, wind southwest, 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 northeast. So a pretty cyclonic month. So that was probably the worst summer on uh, Oxford's records. But there were some good summers as well. And the green line here um, shows last summer's temperature, 2018, and the purple line shows the summer of 1826, which was a beautiful summer. So the summers weren't all bad at that time, and in fact the summer of 1826 remained the warmest on Oxford's records until the great summer of 1976. But of course it's, without these long records we wouldn't know that the, the summer was, was so good. Now, of course, the summer of 1976 uh, comes up. Rich has already mentioned this, this photograph. This is the uh, Wolvercote Bridge, um, and you can just about see a trickle of water coming through. The water would normally be up here somewhere, of, of, of course. And um, this was the time, the great summer of 1976. Um, I can look around at a room and say, how many people remember the summer of 1976? 
and get quite a few hands up. When I do this at the Reading University with a room full of students, I don't get many hands going up. But um, what, what I'm showing here is the, the flow of the Thames at Day's Weir, and this is uh, in terms of cubic metres per second, this is a logarithmic scale, uh, for every day of the year from October 1975 up to the end of September 1976. This is the average for the, what, 80 years of record. This is the highest for any individual day, and this is the lowest for any individual day, which for most of the days of the year is still 1976's records. And you can see that at the beginning of July 1976, the Thames actually ran dry, and that's the only time in the records that we have for the Thames that the Thames actually ran dry. There was a number of emergency uh, legislations enacted to stop groundwater abstraction and so on, which then enabled the Thames to flow again for a, a little while. Um, but it remained very, very low, and it's never been anything like as low as that uh, since then. So that's the summer of 1976. And now what I'm going to do to, to close up is I'm going to talk about some of the events that have only occurred once in 200 years of the record, or 250 years for the rainfall. The wettest month on Oxford's record, surprisingly, was a September. September is not normally a very wet month. In fact, in the months it's about average for the, for the months as a whole. So what I put up here is Thomas Hornsby's records for September 1774, and these are the rainfall records. Now, as we mentioned earlier, when the weather got exciting, he did more observations during the day. And you can see this is a very wet period, so he was doing observations quite, quite frequently. And what I've plotted here is the cumulative rainfall for the month, the blue bars, and it went up to around 223 millimetres. And I've plotted barometric pressure from Thomas Hornsby's own records, records from London and records from Exeter as well. And you can see there's a, pa a couple of passages of really quite deep depressions, but there's an awful lot of rain here. There must have been an absolutely extraordinary amount of flooding um, around Oxford. And in fact, when we look at the total, the month total was 224 millimetres. No other month has ever had more than 192. So the difference between number one and number two is 32 millimetres. The difference between the next nine wettest is only 26. So for the statisticians amongst you, this is an outlier and then some. It's a long, long way out uh, of the normal extreme. And certainly we worry about floods in Oxford these days, but if we had anything like this amount of rainfall, in the middle of January, it would make a tremendous, absolutely tremendous flood. So it has happened in the past. I guess it will happen again. Another event that's only occurred once in the 200 years was the hottest day of the year. On average, the hottest day of the year is around the end of July. Normally in a year, the temperature would get to around just over 30 degrees C. Only once has the hottest day of the year been recorded in October. And in 2011... The hottest day of the year occurs on the 1st of October. This is one of the marvellous things about British weather, that occasionally it throws up one completely from left field, the hottest day of the year at the end of October. It was a fairly cool summer, but even so, it was extraordinary that we had that at the, uh, at the beginning of October. <coughs> 1976 heat wave. During 1976... 14 consecutive days reached 30 degrees C between the 25th of June and the 8th of July. No other heat wave on the record has been longer than six days. Six days occurred in 1995. Three times it occurred, it was a five day heat wave. But 14 days, again, in terms of statistical outlier, this is a long way off, off the chart. <coughs> so, well, it's warming up today, maybe we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll beat this, you never know. But as summers get warmer, this is going to happen more and more frequently. But it'll be quite a while before we beat that record, I think. One that we wouldn't want to beat this year, <laughs> a summer snowfall. Tim and I were astounded to discover from the records a record of falling snow in the early hours of the 11th of July, 1888. And at first we thought, well, maybe this is a uh, hail maybe this is you know a misinterpretation of sort of slushy hail or something but there was hail earlier in the month as well when it was called hail this was called snow so we checked in the published records and that day the 11th of july 1888 
there were snow showers as far south as the Isle of Wight. Mm. And you think the summers today are cool. Mm. It's a long time since we've had snow showers in July in the Isle of Wight. This is the snopter chart from the Daily Weather Report of the time. So it's a really cold northerly sweeping down. There was snow uh, down to quite low levels on the hills in northern England. And I suspect even the, the Cotswolds may have had a snow covering for a time that morning. So 1888, we've heard several instances, wasn't a good year for the, uh, for, for the weather. Uh, so just almost to, to finish off, I won't go through these in detail, but these are some of the extremes, the hottest, coldest day, the wettest day, and so on. All the details of these uh, are, in the, uh, are in the book. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank the directors and the observers. These records haven't been magically obtained by some automatic weather station. These are people who go out and do the observations at 9 o'clock every day, and there are a couple of the uh, people who've done these in the room today. Um, and starting off with the heritage of, uh, of Thomas Hornsby, um, and this is Gordon Smith, for those of you who remember Gordon Smith, in his um, wartime uniform. Um, and there's Emma measuring the snowfall in uh, a recent winter, uh, a couple of Amy doing the weather when it was much sunnier. Um, but if it wasn't for the people doing these and the directors to, to manage the, uh, the Met Station, um, then obviously we wouldn't have the records that we have today. So I'd like to close by thanking them for their, uh, for their time over these years. <laughs>